So welcome to Engaging and Empowering School Libraries, a podcast that aims to raise the profile of school libraries by talking about topics that are current across education and teaching. Today, we're revisiting our discussion around AI in school libraries. As we know, the AI world is moving fast. Every day there is something new and it's almost impossible to keep up. We want to take this conversation away from the tools and back to the skills needed to navigate the AI world and how to use it ethically. This week, I came across a post on LinkedIn from Linda Hoseth, an international, an international librarian, talking about how she and Anthony Copeland, a technology integration specialist, had together approached the use of ChatGPT with their students. Both Linda and, and Anthony are in Dubai, which will give this podcast an international flavour today, but we hope that learning from others across the world will help with our practice here in the UK. So alongside me today is my co-host, Sabrina Cox. Thank you all for joining me. So can I start by asking you to introduce yourselves and can we start with Linda? Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, Linda. Um, I am a high school librarian at the American School of Dubai. My husband and I have been teaching internationally for over 30 years. So this is, I think, our seventh international school or country. Um, the schools that we tend to work in are either American or international in name, but very similar in that they have students from between 50 and 100 nationalities um, who are typically ex expats who are living globally around the world and, and, and go to school in an American style system. Okay, thank you. And, and Anthony? Yeah, uh, so I've been teaching for just over a, a decade internationally, uh, initially as, as a, a physics teacher. Um, but then I, I gradually grew into the into the edtech space. Um, I, I first moved to Dubai where I, I taught physics before moving to the Hong Kong where I, I started stepping into roles like learning technologies coach and technology integration specialist. Um, I then moved back to Dubai and, and continued that. Um, and of course, now I, I work as a, a full time technology integration specialist for the, the American School of Dubai here. Okay, can I just ask, have you, obviously with, with the explosion of AI, have you noticed a significant difference to what you, you do on a day-to-day -day basis in your job? Of course, of course. Um, I mean, what, what's almost been a bit frustrating is that I think uh, communicating about the, the upcoming potential uh, for AI in education almost landed on on deaf ears a lot of the time and sometimes i felt like um uh, a bit of a, a doomsday call <laughs> that uh, ai is coming um and then of course in november 21 when uh chat gpt dropped all of a sudden it's all anybody could uh could talk about um but so, I'm glad that sorry go on so were you aware like you know i've talked to other people about you know, AI being around for a long, long time before ChatGPT arrived and, and really, you know, the basics like, you know, spell check and mm. um, Amazon wish lists and that kind of stuff was just part of life. Was there, was there more coming that you could see before ChatGPT like, that was going to affect schools? Were you aware of the the potential of, of AI before it landed on us? I think the um, technology integrator space was pretty aware. Um, none of us saw um, the kind of the sudden progress that was seen with uh, GPT-3 and ChatGPT as a, as a platform. But um, if you look uh, maybe a year or so uh, before ChatGPT launched, um, you look at the courses being offered by Google and ISTE, uh, there was a lot on AI in education. Uh, Google released things like its teachable machine and that that drawing game where um really just to to familiarize to familiarize students with um AI concepts. So it was certainly an emerging topic. Um, but I think we were all surprised um when ChatGPT launched uh, at, at just how much progress had been made in such little time. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. So can we start by by talking about sharing how you initially approached the integration of ChatGPT in your school's curriculum, considering initial concerns around its use for educational purposes. It, you know, it, it was, you know, there was a lot of talk, wasn't it, right at the beginning that, that you know, 
it, it was I it was it seemed to be one side or the other one side was ban it and the other side was like we should be looking at it and, and doing something with it but obviously there were lots of concerns how did you as a school approach that let's stay with Anthony for now how did you approach that yeah, of course. We we were slow. We were careful. I mean, you've you've mentioned uh, ChatGPT specifically, and and as I said, that launched um, November twenty one. Um, and looking back at the initial launch, there were three pretty big roadblocks for us in in using that with students. Um, primarily, there was there were data privacy concerns. I don't know if people remember, but initially you couldn't switch off. The use of uh, open AI, open AI's use of your data, you know, it was going into training the model. It was being stored. Um, that changed in about that was April twenty three. Um, the other issue we had was the terms of use. Initially, the first uh, terms of use uh, for ChatGPT stated that users had to be older than eighteen, um, yeah. and of course that changed in in March of twenty three. Uh, it was the third one that was kind of the most <laughs> that wouldn't that we couldn't quite. Uh, quite work around and that was um the requirement for a personal mobile number to be yeah, used on exactly yeah now, for us that was a, a non-negotiable um and I, I think it should have been for every school uh we we don't want to use any tool where students need to to submit their personal phone number yeah. um and what i found interesting there didn't seem to be an official announcement that that had changed it was almost by chance that I just decided to go back one day and, and recreate an open AI account with a new email address. And I found that I only needed the email address. Uh, so all of a sudden we were in a situation where students could create an open AI account using only their school managed email address. And that was kind of revolutionary for us because that suddenly those three roadblocks were, were removed. Um, but prior to that, uh, we, we started just by planning department specific sessions for teachers uh, from about January 22 um, and that was done hand in hand with Linda and Linda I, I think it's fair to say that we both learned a lot during those sessions. Yeah let me bring you in Linda. <laughs> uh, you're on mute still. As we as we um, were talking about what we were going to talk about today I went back to look at my messages because ChatGPT dropped November of 21 yeah. and December Anthony was the one who was like and there's and this there's this development and there's this development and then our teachers were talking and there was that sense of panic and over the holiday break I emailed our principal and said we need to get on this and so as soon as we got back in January we had a meeting with the head of curriculum and our principal and and proposed that we wanted to go to each department and talk specifically about what chat GPT could look like for their department because as you can imagine, some teachers were, this is terrible, this is the end of education, and others were, this is amazing, I want to use it with my students tomorrow, and the school's position was, no, not yet, and so our focus was, what can teachers do to use and to explore with this new tool, and yeah. um, I have, on Twitter, I, or X, I found a, a slide deck prepared by Dr. Tori Trust, who's from, I wrote this down, the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And she just had some really great explanations and use cases and possible uses. So we we started with that, with acknowledging her work and thanking her work for her work, um, and then made it specific per department. And I think one of the things that helped is I have a humanities background. I used to teach English before being in the library. Anthony, as he said, has a science background. And so we were able to look at it from the different lenses of how teachers might want to use it and really focus it for them, knowing that most of them were at a very early starting point. Like some, maybe half had created accounts by that time, but most hadn't. Um, and so sometimes it was their first time playing with it. And the other thing that Anthony did is I wanna give him a little plug for this is he started writing a book no um, of, of sources and things, prompts <laughs> for teachers to use. And, and so was just really instrumental in providing information for all of us on how it was used yeah so do you do you sorry let's get this question out are all your teachers now using it no no okay so there's still there's still some that are resistant or scared or unsure or don't want to what's the do you get the feeling um I think I've heard some express that they feel like 
it's cheating and a good teacher shouldn't have to do that. Okay. Um, I feel like there are some who are just uninterested in learning and, and don't really want to take the time. Yeah. Um, but many are, and our school has offered that through the tech department has offered, uh, an asynchronous course where teachers could learn together, watch videos, comment. Um, and Anthony was involved in the creation of that. And so there is a lot of conversation, but I wouldn't say that everybody's using it yet. No, I'm going to say it, it, it certainly, it feel if you're on social media, doesn't it? It feels like everybody's using it, but actually the people on social media aren't everybody. <laughs> and, and actually there is a lot of people, a lot of teachers, a lot of librarians that are really are not, haven't even opened it up yet. So it, there's still lots of time for anybody who's listening to still jump on this this train and and join in. Anthony, can I bring you back in? Yeah, of course. I mean, just to to kind of give you an idea of the 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 roadmap that we've we've been working to. We myself and Linda started delivering these these workshops for departments uh, January twenty two. Uh, of course, we've had an entire academic year between between then and now, and I would say that our last academic year we were kind of in this this weird between space where, you know, the, the cat was out of the bag with, with Gen AI, you know, we were all aware of its existence. Um, and I think as much as we were trying to, uh, to educate faculty on how to use Gen AI, Gen AI, of course, another large concern, I think quite rightly was the, the integrity of our assessments now and how yeah. to protect that whilst we pivot. Of course, we don't have a new way of working immediately available and we have these these kind of older assessment models that we're still using how do we protect those how do we how do we keep the integrity as i've said um so i think a lot of last year was exploring you know tools like uh lockdown browser and, and ai detection and really trying to understand how no ai use could could still be moderated and facilitated for better or worse i mean i'll be the first to say that we need to move to assessment models that incorporate ai um, but I also see that it's important to, to protect these these old assessment models whilst the new normal is being kind of settled into. Absolutely. That's the thing, isn't it, is that you can't change these things overnight. They're, they're massive integrations and institutions and, and everything else. And actually, it is, we're not going to be able to move as quickly as chat GPT exploding onto our, you know, into our space. So although you're right, it I think that the model will change eventually, but we do have to to protect what we have. It, it's really interesting, just as a as a user of um, AI myself. There's so many ethical questions. So things like you know helping me to create a lesson plan as an example, you know, it's seconds, isn't it? It's as if you write write the right prompt, and and it even helps you prompt it now, which is really interesting. Uh, to to you the there are tools that can write amazing blogs for you if you can give them the outline and and you know admittedly I used one the other day and I using my own specialism and that's where that's where the 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 difference is isn't it as a specialist in my subject AI can generate a blog post but I understand by reading through it, what is right, what is wrong, how I change it, where it's going. And, you know, you then say at the bottom, I've used AI to help me write this, you know. And it's really weird, the reaction you get from that. Some go, wow, that's great. Other people who don't know you, don't know your expertise, think, well, that's written by AI. <laughs> you know? So even in that kind of world, in that kind of setup, and this is adult world. This is, you know, talking to adults about it. There's going to be huge changes ahead and how we all we all use it ethically. Um, so part of me, going on long-winded, part of me wanted to go, okay, well, maybe I should have not said that I'd used AI to help write that. You know, so that must be, you know, tenfold more difficult in an educational setting and how we're teaching our students. Um, so... Can you talk about your collaboration? So maybe Linda, is that is that you've talked about how you've you've created something for your teachers. We're sort of heading now towards the fact that maybe some of those barriers have been 
that you talked about have been lifted, which does allow your students to be able to use AI within education. So Linda, talk about, can you talk to me? Because I think people in, would be interested to hear how you and Anthony work together to, to teach the skills that students need, um, if you don't mind. I think that Anthony's perspective is is more from the how does AI work and teaching students how it works and, and helping them master that. And my perspective as a teacher librarian, so I collaborate with teachers on, on research lessons and teaching research skills that are specific to the content area. So my lens is, well, how does this help them get to where they're going or where they need to go with the content and with understanding how to research? And so we've been approaching it pretty cautiously and slowly. And, and I love it that often we will go into the class together alongside the classroom teacher. And so we are all, we are all giving the same message and we are, but different parts of that message. Um, so for example, our, we started once the, once the personal phone number requirement was lifted and we had permission to actually ask students to use AI as part of a class, which had been forbidden to us before that, um, we started with the highest level research we cl class we have on campus, which is the AP research class. And it's guided by a set of standards from the college board. And the college board has been very specific about for this particular class, here is what you can and can't use AI to do. And so we prepared a lesson where we went in and Anthony first talked to the students about, about, okay, this has been opened up to you. It's now available. And we know that they were using it at home. We know that they were using yeah. it on their own, but this was the first time we could actually say here, we're going to talk with you about how to use it. And so we had written a number of scenarios and had them sort them into acceptable or unacceptable um, mm -hmm. based on these college board standards. And that generated some really great conversation. Um, starting out with Anthony's explanation of ChatGPT as a large language model and how that actually worked, they were, their minds were blown. They, they were really, they were, um, we asked them at the end, like what, how much of this did you know before? And they said, none of it. Like they, yeah. they hadn't known any of it before. And so I think that double pronged approach of here's what it is and what it does and what it can do and can't do. And here's how we are going to use it and how we can and how we shouldn't, I think is really important. Yeah. So so can you just, can I go a, a step back slightly? You said you were working with the older students and you mentioned what it was. Is this a, is, it's not something that I've heard of. Is it some kind of research lesson that they have to do? Yeah, so for the, for the advanced placement curriculum, which is an American style okay. curriculum. And, and it's not, you're probably familiar with the IB. Um, it's different with the IB in that it's not a, a whole course of studies. Typically, they can just pick and choose certain classes. But one of the thing, one of the classes that they can choose to do is called AP research. So advanced placement research. Okay. And they end up writing essentially a senior thesis. Um, so they, after learning lots of different research skills, then choose a topic of their own interest and conduct original research and, and write a paper, um, present, give a presentation. The, the paper is externally assessed. So it's, it's a year long intensive process after they took a seminar class the year before. So they, it, it's quite sophisticated. So it's very specifically research skills. So have you, have you, um, yet integrated it into a into a subject and maybe um, a little bit lower down so then the next step was um i have an uh, an english class just a, a regular grade 11 english class and they are starting a research paper and so often when they start a research paper they'll come to me and i will have curated sources for them um specific to their topics on a lib guide i will have books for them we will set up we use a citation tool called Noodle Tools. And so we'll get their account set up. We'll talk to them about, here are the expectations for this assignment. You're going to have to create a work cited. You're going to have to use in-text citations. You need to, we want you to learn how to use databases, all of these things. Yeah. Um, and so in that initial setup lesson, I included that slide, which is what I posted on LinkedIn, which is what you saw, yeah, which is specifically for this assignment, here is what, here is an appropriate use of AI. Here is an inappropriate use of AI, and it's inappropriate because 
AI literally can't do what this is asking it to do. Mm -hmm. And then here's an unethical use of AI. And the, the unethical use or a dishonest use, I think was the term we used. A dishonest use was if you are meant to be learning something or practicing something and you ask AI to do it, then you're not doing the learning or the practicing. Yeah. If you are meant to be learning something and you ask your tutor or friend or parent to do it for you, also unethical because you are not doing the learning. So if you would ask AI to do that same thing, that would also be considered dishonest. Um, so that's kind of the approach. So now uh, next week I have a physics class coming in and, and I've modified the slide for that specific assignment. But again, saying, here's how you can use AI. Here's how you shouldn't use AI because it won't really work. Here's how you shouldn't use AI because it's dishonest. Um, and I, I think that's been helpful. Yeah, Anthony, do you wanna, can I bring you in? Yeah, and, and just to give, um, I suppose the wider context of that from a technology integration perspective, right now what we're doing um, here is we're, we're really just cherry picking the students and the teachers that we pilot these tools with. We're really not in a position right now where there's a mass rollout uh, and that it's been kind of communicated officially that we are using AI like ChatGPT across the school. Um, and these pilots, they they do have quite tight structures on, on a fairly narrow use case, but that's allowing myself and Linda to really practice the communication, to practice how this is going to be used in the in the classroom. Um, soon, I, I hope quite soon, the tools will graduate to a, a common AI toolbox. Um, and that's going to come hand in hand with the rest of the documentation. Um, I was saying to Linda the other day, you know, we've been ready to talk about AI policy since day one. Yeah. Um, what we haven't been ready for is to communicate which tools are ready for student use. And personally, I think until fairly recently, no tools have been ready for student use. Mm -hmm. So do you do you have like we all talk about ChatGPT as the main one, the only thing, but there's so many more. Are there ones that you've noted that you are specifically going to use it would you would you encourage the use of chat gpt within a within a research lesson at this point i think we're really looking at upper high school for chat right. gpt that's kind of the the end goal um yeah. what i'm envisaging i suppose is a um a graduation through tools that are kind of more um formalized for education uh and then finally having students like rap research students using chat gpt more freely okay. um my favorite tools at the moment are the um the chatbots that allow full teacher oversight and and uh, overview. I don't know if you've seen the likes of uh, Mizu, where teachers can create chatbots for the students to use and practice with, but they're actually able to see those chats happening in real time. Uh, okay. And I think that's going to be important moving forward. Um, so there are tools we're looking at. Um, so what? I've Sorry, Sorry things on. like per perplexity, that kind of thing. Would you bring that in? On my list. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gradually creating a just table. Want, I just want to show you that I know one or two. <laughs> <laughs> we are looking at them. I'm, I'm collecting. I think again, we we have to go slow to go fast. We yeah. we need to be aware of the any privacy concerns there might be with these tools. We have to be aware of how they may be misused. <laughs> Um, and I think one thing a lot of people don't realize, because we're seeing hundreds of tools be re uh, being released that, that incorporate AI, but we still only have a handful of models. Yeah. So these tools are just sending data to one of these three models. And, and that makes it interesting for us in tech and integration, because when we look at that data privacy, we have to really evaluate both companies. It's not just... OK, uh, I'll use Magic School as an example. It's not just, OK, what is Magic School doing with student data? But to what extent is that data when it gets to OpenAI's GPT? How is that then used by by OpenAI? Right. Um, and I suppose the other problem that we have is that even if you set up something now that was a structure and the tools that are currently available this time next year, it, it may be something completely different. So your setup needs to be less about specific tools and more about the, the skill set of any of the AI that's coming along. How, how would you manage, how, how do you 
envisage managing that or are you just managing with the tools that you have at the moment yeah i think there's seemingly a, a lot of things that that ai can do i think what what excites me the most are tools that allow students to be creative with with these models um so i'm excited by chatbots i'm excited by the likes of perplexity there's there's also a lot of novelty being generated in this space you know oh use this tool it will generate five questions or use this tool it'll turn you know your prompt into a rap song <laughs> um I'm, I'm far less excited by those because i think they they kind of narrow students into specific tasks um, and I think really, if if the closer students are to the direct models, yes, we'll see a kind of as time goes on, we'll see an increase in in the seeming intelligence of these models. But for the most part, actually, I think I think the use of these models is going to stay fairly fairly the same. They're still going to need to evaluate output. The models may get better at doing certain tasks. Um, and for that reason, I I do see our policy documentation, our guidelines as living documents. The AI toolbox I mentioned absolutely will be a, a living document. I mean, we have a, a technology toolbox here at ASD already, um, and that in itself is is reviewed um, each year, and it's added to by faculty to find new tools that might be useful um, mm -hmm. for their own practice. Um, so yeah, it's it's an evolving landscape, but I don't think the uh, the core of it is moving as quickly as the kind of edge use cases for novel practices, if that. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that's that's yeah. It, it it's almost trying not to be swallowed by this next new exciting tool, and you know the latest one that uh, is seems to be coming is some kind of video, isn't it? That that you can it's going to completely disrupt the film world, you know, because you can create something that just by telling it to do it. it and actually those things are going to come aren't they but it's but it's about it's funny isn't it it's about words again rather than rather than the picture that you end up creating it's how good are your words and and it's great because that really links into what librarians and and pe people who are interested in literacy are going to benefit this is the next step isn't it that actually ai can be used to to cheat if that's the right word but actually if your if your literacy and your wordsmith is is good enough it, or is you know is enhanced you'll get more from it so it works hand in hand doesn't it can i bring linda back in and and talk about um the the no i'm going to not ethical considerations but more about the research skills uh, how has how has AI or chat GBT um influenced your students' research skills at the moment? And how do you see, you know, is there something, you know, are are students going to use it as a crutch or or are there is it going to enhance what they do is the question, I suppose. I think um they could use it as a crutch if we're not careful about the kinds of assignments we're giving them. Right. For me, teaching research has always been about the process and not the product. And so it's how do you pose a question, go find information to answer that question, take that information from multiple sources, and then meld it together into something new. And, and if teachers come to me at the end of an assignment and say, well, I think, the, I, I think the student just plagiarized this or they copied this or whatever, my question to them is, well, where's the process? And all along, if we can't ask the students, or if the students can't show us the process that they followed, the notes that they took, the sources that they gathered, whatever, then we can't really trust where the work has come from. And no. that's that was the same before ChatGPT came yeah. along, right? And so if, and one of, the, one of the inappropriate uses that I talked about with the students for this particular research assignment was, you can't ask it to take information from multiple sources, integrate it into a new thought, and cite those sources so that we can go back and trace all of those facts. I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Anthony, but it can't do that yet, right? And so what we need to see is you gathering the sources along the way. And if ChatGPT helps you come up, helps you maybe organize the information, awesome, right? If it helps you, if you put in some of your text and say, I'm not sure this is 
clear? Can you help me figure it out? Awesome. Um, for these AP research students, one of the things that the college board said specifically was you cannot give it an entire study, research study, and ask it to explain it to you because that's what one of the things that we're trying to teach you to do. But you could, if in the context of reading this study, there's a paragraph that's confusing to you, you could have a conversation with AI about that and help understand it as you would with your teacher, right? You would never go to your teacher and say, I don't understand this study. Can you tell me the whole thing? <laughs> but you might say, I I've been reading this. This is what I get. This is the part that confuses me. Can you check my understanding? AI can help you with that. Yes. And so I, I think if we're only looking at end products, yes, it's easy for students to use it as a crutch and to not do the learning and to cheat. Um, if we are using it as a tool that will help you along the way, I think it's really beneficial. Yeah, I, th I think it has got that element. It, it, it's interesting you talking about the process. I talk a lot about FOSSIL, the framework of skills for inquiry learning. And that is all about the process, you know, our, our understanding that, that research skills are building blocks. And actually in order to get to that year 12 research project, you need to actually have the understanding of everything else that's gone before. <clears throat> and actually, if you just put it in simpler terms, as in, you know, in you're in a maths class, so you know, if you just write the answer and you get it right or you get it wrong, it, it doesn't it doesn't ex demonstrate how you got to the answer. And actually we're expected, or I know when I was at school, I'm assuming it's still the same, that you are expected to show you're working out to get to your answer. Because even if you got the answer wrong, you you might you would have got marks for the process. So so and and it's very much the same. And I think that's almost more important now with AI on the on the, the scene than than it was before. Anthony, can I bring you back in? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean I've I've been thinking a lot as we as we kind of graduate now towards student use of AI in in learning, I think a, a big question for us and a, a, a big part of the messaging going forward is that the future of learning and the the, the knowledge work the students do in class, um, it's not necessarily just is that human done or is that AI done? But is it human done or AI done or human plus AI done? Mm -hmm. um, and it's that middle ground that I'm trying to communicate right now. And I think the the real challenge for us as, as educators, as we integrate AI into the student work that's being done, is ensuring that our assessments, um, both for assessment for learning and assessment of learning, are targeting the learner's outcomes and not the AI's outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how, how would that be done though? Is that's that's yeah. But is that through the process again then? Is that is well, that? It's yeah. something I've been thinking deeply about at the moment. I've been trying to kind of construct some case studies for our teachers here, right. um, where I've shown uh, kind of an AI use that's gone on in the classroom, and then I've shared two learning objectives. One where it's it's aligned perfectly, and the AI isn't facilitating anything that that learner objective is is leading to the learner outcome uh, and then cases where there maybe is misalignment um so for example i've been uh i mean we're talking about chat gpt today but i'm also exploring text to image ai right. um and in the english classroom we have students looking at a graphic novel and the assessment is for them to construct a couple of pages that could have existed within or either end of that narrative story Okay. And the teacher's really just assessing the narrative and have they applied graphic novel principles. Uh, so we've been using text to image AI to construct the, the images that go into that graphic novel. That isn't an assessed component. It's not one of the learner outcomes that they can draw beautiful pictures. No. Uh, so that integration is aligned perfectly. However, if I'd taken the same use to our uh, digital design class and they were using it to construct their final project, then you could say that, that probably isn't aligned very well. The, the learning outcome there is that they can construct beautiful pictures. Yeah, because it's interesting, isn't it? Because we talk about, uh, and one of the, sorry, we, we talk about, our, our goal, isn't it, is, is about students learning and understanding at the end of the day. It's not about them regurgitating the information that we give them. And and it it it's likely, isn't it, that that it's going to become 
more of a an opportunity to for students to discuss more about their learning and and be able to I think in this AI and online world, it's even more important that we are encouraging our students to talk. They seem to talk less and less these days and it's it's all on their phones, isn't it? And actually I found that some of the you know, students that I've worked with recently, they know the answers, but they can't verbalize it. They can't explain their learning. They get shocked when you ask them, how do you feel about that? <laughs> or what's your own opinion? Because they're, they're just, so unused to doing that and actually I think I feel AI is is going to open a door to that that wasn't open previously um because we got especially in the UK very stuck on you know a, a, a levels and GCSE exams and and you know teach to the test this kind of thing but I think we mentioned it before and Anthony that that assessment is going to have to change isn't it and and do you do you see that that's going to become more of a more of a process assessment or a verbal assessment? Do you have any thoughts on how that might change? Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing I've I've commented on quite often, and I'm I'm quite excited by this. Is uh, I mean, one I think one big large part of uh, of my kind of philosophy of of teaching and learning is that. Um, student work should be project-based it should be authentic it should be um it should be much more than the the essay or the or the written test so I think what excites me about this shift in landscape is it seems to be quite damaging to old methods of, of assessment for learning but actually it, it offers opportunity for for newer more again project-based or problem-based learning to be supercharged in fact and if we're mindful, again, going back to being mindful of what the AI is actually augmenting, what it's enhancing and ensuring that, that isn't a assessed outcome, um, I think we can develop assessments that are actually quite exciting and then really raise the bar uh, in what students are able to achieve to display that learning. Absolutely. Can I bring Linda back in? Yeah, I think that already we've seen more creative assignments and and while much of my time is teaching how to do a research paper, which is a skill that some students will need for some careers and future endeavors, mm -hmm. a lot more of it is teaching them to, to learn something and then share that information in a new way. And so mm -hmm. we had geography students and they were doing um, research on developing nations and the issues that caused migration. And so they ended up with their research creating picture books to then communicate their learning to fifth grade students. And again, it, it's not, we don't care if they can draw. That's not, that wasn't the point of it. It was, could you find this information that's reliable and trustworthy and, and meeting the objectives of your geography course and communicate that in a way to a different audience. And so many of them, the AI generated books were, were stunning. And there were kids who could draw and, and chose to illustrate their own, but that wasn't the point of the assessment. Yeah. The, the point was the geography. And and they mastered it. It was it was brilliant. Because it's interesting, isn't it? Um, we talk about when I'm talking about fossil, we talk about the product and you know, the product being your essay, your poster, your whatever. But if you if you're really interested in the the outcome, the the product isn't isn't doesn't necessarily have to be beautiful, does it? Like just like you're saying, Linda, it doesn't matter if you can't draw. So, so we found in the past that actually, you know, you tell students that they're going to create a PowerPoint or they're going to create a poster, and they spend the six weeks that they should be re researching just on making this poster look pretty, and there's nothing on it. You know, it's like so. It's it. It's almost sort of that that side of it is still there. But we're almost enabling students who maybe aren't good drawers, who aren't artistic, to actually come up with something that is really exciting for them, but teaching the skills at the same time. It sounds like it can be really, really exciting going forward, I think. Anthony? Yeah, and I, I think what's really nice about that, bringing AI into the classroom and having them use those tools, is that 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 plus, we talk about human plus AI use and that plus the kind of process that students adopt to, to use AI, that then becomes part of the, the informal curriculum as mm -hmm. such. So actually giving them 
the opportunity to use these tools, they'll they'll find opportunity to use them better. I I mentioned that graphic uh, novel lesson. I was I was part of that last year. We would we were just using Canva, and we were yeah. looking at uh, the graphic elements in Canva uh, for them to kind of construct their their scenes. And it took a lot of time. Students would spend a long time on Canva trying to find just <laughs> the right image to to edit and kind of force into what they were envisaging. Um, but then by bringing text to AI into the classroom, suddenly they're using the English language to yeah. try and get what they're imagining to emerge from the AI. And I think the the educational kind of benefit to that was was tenfold. It was it was really great to see. It's such a it's such a benefit, isn't it? This this suddenly having to use words <laughs> to to make something happen is is fascinating. I it it's it reminds me a little bit of a, I did a, a Google Hangout pre-COVID with a class that were, it was a year four class that were um, researching India. And I brought my um, daughter-in-law uh, online to speak to them. And we'd, we'd set them up with a whole load of questions that they could ask so that we could, you know, not look, make sure that they were going to engage with her when she was on the screen. But actually what happened was that, she answered questions that the children themselves weren't expecting. And, and it made them think of much better questions than they'd originally had. And I suppose that's what AI does, isn't it? It provides that another extra level to a topic or a subject that makes them think beyond. So, so do you know the fact that if if they'd been if the teacher had been sat in front of that class and the students had had the questions, it would have been they would have asked the questions and the teacher would have answered it because of the relationship that they already have with the children. Whereas an external person who is from India talking to them generated something different. And I think that this is where AI is going. And I think it's really exciting. I think, you know, like I said before, literacy levels and reading. You know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot to be said about the fact that people, you know, it's going to stop children having to write. But I think in some ways it almost is having to make them write more. Uh, you had your hand up, Anthony. Do you want to come back in? Yeah, I think what, what you've touched on is is something I've been thinking about a lot lately is the way that uh, students can be led to kind of new ideas using AI. And I think that's one of the most beneficial things I'm seeing in, in putting AI in front of students. You're right, they're, they're kind of thinking of new things that they can ask based on the feedback that they had prior from the AI. And it kind of turns that idea of prompting on its head a little. And I talk about the AI prompting the student in, in some way, mm -hmm. uh, and that it shouldn't just be looked at as, oh, I asked the AI to do something and it does it for me, but I give the AI my ideas and then that prompts me to have further ideas myself. Yeah. And there being almost this cyclical nature of um of the AI prompting the user as much as the user is prompting the AI. Yeah, because it's interesting just having used it myself, trying to get AI to create what's in my head <laughs> on the screen is is not as easy as it seems, is it? You do need, you know, I'm I'm not explaining this as well as I should be because it's not understanding what I'm saying or what I want it to create. And I think that that is a real positive a real enhancement that can be beneficial in education going forward so you know we've talked a little bit about about things that potentially are going to come up um you did say that you have have I got this right that you've not um uh integrated it across your whole school yet so you've got little pockets if that's right yeah. We are piloting select tools right now that we think could form an AI toolbox. Um, as I said, as soon as we do release guidelines for student use of AI, what has to be in the same breadth is, okay, which tools are we envisaging students using? Okay. So we're kind of wayfinding right now which tools can be used and, and in which way. So have you used it with younger students yet or not? Like not yet. Not yet. No. We no. have um, piloted Mizu in middle school right um and that's really the only as far as i can think i think that's the only other text to text ai that we've that we've put in front and of students and that's presumably very locked down very specific to... it is it's 
chatbot I was describing the gifts. Oh yes, the chatbot you did say. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so are there any? So obviously within that, like we, it would just be interested to hear about things that you're particularly excited about or particularly concerned about. Linda, can I bring you back in? So obviously, as as it develops, as AI develops, the skill set is obviously going to have to to increase. Now, I've had other conversations where we've talked about the skills of research don't really change whether it's AI or not. Do you think that that's right? Or do you think that there are, is there a skill set that you're going to need to have as a school librarian? I think that the basic research skill set is still the skill set, right? I think yeah. it's still the process and we have additional tools to help us with the process at different stages. And that's that's what we're going to have to learn and, and help teach the students. I mean, I found that when we first stood in front of a class and, and talked about ChatGPT, they almost got uncomfortable because it was something that they had been using illicitly and they thought yeah. right in the background <laughs> and so they were like oh they, they know about it too and so I think just having those upfront conversations with yeah here here's this amazing tool that can help us in this process at what stages might it be an assist and at what stages might you be asking it to do something that you're really supposed to be learning to do right it's a we're, yeah. we're trying to build up your skill set um so I think it's just an additional tool that's that's more helpful than not. So do you think, what would you say to, to a school librarian who's maybe listening that is, had never looked at, at AI or ChatGPT, who may be feeling a little bit nervous about it, that if they have to then teach it, how are they going to? Do you know, how, is uh, it such a big transition? Get an Anthony at your school. Um, <laughs> 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 I learned so much from him, but also you can start slow and and acknowledge where your kids are at. Find out what the students are already using and and doing. Um, you know, there's there are paraphrasing tools that are very um, limited AI, like a Quillbot, something like that. Your students are probably already using that. So having conversations about what what that might be useful for and what that's not useful for. Um, and, and not sticking your head in the sand. Like yeah. this is this is here. It's, it, the students know it's here. And so it's really our responsibility to to stay ahead of them as much as we can and to and to guide them in understanding what's great about this tool and, and what we should avoid with this tool. Yeah, yeah. Can I just ask Anthony, uh, has it been useful having Linda or somebody like Linda on the journey with you what has that what difference has that made to you so say imagine Linda didn't exist or somebody like Linda didn't exist how would it have impacted what you did what you do I think people would have had a much harder time understanding me <laughs> <laughs> okay um I think Linda spends so much time with our teaching faculty uh talking about about research skills and and really a lot of what we're looking at uh when we talk about AI for for learning is essentially AI for inquiry AI for research and I think having somebody with such expert knowledge in how that is achieved in schools um and being able to have conversations about how AI might reshape that has been invaluable to me yeah uh, and yeah, has really helped. I think, again, she's mentioned us coming from kind of two quite different uh, perspectives. Uh, myself from the natural sciences, teaching science, which can be quite um, quite different, actually, from humanities. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, it's it's allowed us to to kind of land on a workflow, I think, that that is um, kind of easily adopt, adapted across across the teaching landscape here. So can I can I ask when you started thinking about integrating technology and AI? Did did sorry, I know sorry, Linda sat here listening, but but did you have to did she have to approach you and say, hey, I've got some skills here? Or did you already have a working relationship? The only reason I'm asking is because there are people out there that you know, if there are teachers listening who are integrating uh, AI technology and haven't spoken to their school librarian, they need to hear how 
the two of you got together and and worked out that actually it works so so you know going back to the question did you already know that linda had the skill set that you you needed her to bring or did she have to approach you how did that work <laughs> no i think i I know that um, not every school has a, a technology integrator, um, but I think any school that does have a technology integrator, um, they should absolutely have a have a good relationship with the school librarian. I think there's so much kind of overlap there in, in tools that are being used. And again, a, a lot of what our librarians kind of oversee is, is, is learning in inquiry and through research. Um, and I think a lot of what we want to do as integrators is to give students tools to do that to do that better mm. um i don't know if, if Lynn, yeah please linda one of the things that that i have a strong understanding of is the scope and sequence of of the course of study in the social studies and the english classes and so when anthony said oh we can we can now ask students to use it you know where, where do we start we want to start with a targeted approach i knew exactly the class that was working on it at the time where we could integrate it in. And I yeah. would say that in the beginning, it was me tagging along on, on Anthony's coattails um, because he he had done the deep dive and was doing the deep dive into what it did and how it worked. And and so he, I think, graciously let me come along to those meetings and and add what I could about, here's what I know about your, your teaching. Here's what I know about your curricula. Here's how we might integrate it. And so... I, and I think we both have maybe established relationships with different teachers based on our backgrounds as well. And so, yeah. so I'm able to bring him along into the English conversation and, and he brings me along into the science conversations as well. So I think that having that. Because balance, that, I can say that really is important, isn't it? And and a lot of what I did previously was, was having conversations with teachers who were going to teach something and I'd be able to go, ah, did you know this is what we could you know this is what we could do and it's almost encouraging yeah so encouraging school librarians isn't it to sit in to be bold enough to go I just want to sit in and listen to the conversations that are being had about AI in our school um because the more you sit in and listen the more you realize and understand where you fit in and you get braver and you go ah you know this this would work here and and that's what this is all about isn't it is that we've all got different skill sets and we all need to to be able to find a way to bring them together and i think it's lovely the the fact that you've admitted linda that actually anthony had so much more understanding of ai but actually you have brought something to the conversation that anthony on his own wouldn't necessarily have got to which is fascinating so we've almost touched on this, but I want to finish with what advice you'd give to other educators or institutions that are considering integrating ChatGPT or similar AI tools into their curriculum, especially in the light of your experiences and the challenges you've navigated. Can we start with, with Anthony? Yeah, I, I think it needs saying, and of course, I hope I've I've come through in this conversation as a as a tech optimist, um, and I I fully encourage us using the AI. But I I think this conversation would be incomplete without returning to that that all important messaging: uh, go slow to go fast. Um, one thing that we talk about a lot at ASD is responsible innovation, um, and I I think that's more important than ever uh, in this in this current um, sector in AI. Uh, the technology clearly has a lot of potential to achieve great things, um, but I think because of that, many companies are kind of racing to be the the first to market with these innovations, uh, and that race to the top could could quite easily turn into a race to the bottom um, if it's not aligned with with uh, teacher and student values. Um, so I think really uh, don't feel as though you're falling behind. Don't um, kind of bring something. Don't be in too much of a rush to bring things in. As I said, we are still in the piloting phase. We've been extremely cautious, um, but I think that's that's put us in good stead now for the for bringing it into into student use and learning. Fantastic, thank you. And and Linda, what would you say? I feel like um, even if you're not comfortable and you and you don't really have a deep understanding of the knowledge of the of how these systems work, it's here. And I think that that being an ostrich about it is not 
helpful to anybody. The students are already dabbling with it. The parents have questions. It's out there. It's real. And so you don't have to be a master of all of it before you step in. Find an area that is of interest. Find, read somebody's work. Do a little bit of research. That's what we're good at. Uh, and incorporate it into what you're already doing. We are, we can't, we shouldn't be throwing out everything that we've done and say, okay, now we're all in and it, it's all, it's all AI. It's all chat GPT. It's just another tool. And mm -hmm. so like any new tool, you, you figure it out as you go along and you let the students know that that's what you're doing too. It's okay to not understand it completely, but yeah. you also need to, you need to not be afraid to jump in. Fantastic. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll share your pilots at some point. <laughs> If you get the chance to, if they're going to be, um, are they going to be shareable, Anthony? Uh, I'm I'm in the middle of writing something out now that I think uh, describes how I would uh, categorize the, the AI landscape and how schools might be able to to do a, a kind of gap analysis of, of what they have and what they don't have. So maybe okay. look out for that. Uh, that'll okay. be on Perfect. And if you want to share your book um, link with me, um, I'll put them in the show notes below. Thank you so much for giving me your time today, Linda and Anthony. Um, as always, if you'd like to comment on anything you've heard today, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Don't forget to, su to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss out on future discussions. Thank you very much for listening.